Murkowski's not in yet? Nope. You know, I keep thinking that one day this coffee is going to be acceptable. Mm, not today. Nope. Not on day 700 billion of debating the risks and benefits of diaproxenine, maybe tomorrow. Day 700 billion and one. Hey, I've got an idea. We're charged with deciding if nanoscale science can be used to treat diabetes. We already know it can improve the efficacy of sunscreen and the deliciousness of yogurt. When is nanoscience going to tackle institutional coffee? When the FDA can afford more of us to debate and approve it, I suppose. Maybe. Until then. Wow. Flora's a bit of a sweet tooth, huh? Gotta do something. Well, we are looking into the approval of a diabetes medication. Looks like we'll be able to test it out on you any day now. Drink your coffee, Macklin. Sorry. There was a lie. Was your barista glad to see you? As always. Mm. They're always happy to see a sucker willing to pay that much for a cup of coffee, I suppose. Well, at least it lets me stretch my legs a little. Yeah, Flores. You might want to try moving around a bit yourself. You might like it. I at least got a run in this morning, only three miles, but at least it's something. I'll move around when we finish. That is, if we ever do. Oh, come on. It hasn't been that bad, all things considered. The average time it takes to get a new medication to market is... Twelve years, I know. Don't remind me. But listen, we're in the home stretch. Diaproxenine, should it be approved or not? That's the million dollar question. And when we answer it... We'll get a million dollars? More like a billion. We won't. We'll get our modest little paychecks and the billions will go to Western Pharmaceuticals. Yeah, but we will at least be able to leave this room and these fluorescent lights and this industrial grade coffee, which you, Lukowski, never drink. <laughs> of course not. That stuff must be lethal. Flores, you're the toxicologist. What's your professional opinion of this coffee? It hasn't killed me yet. But we don't know the long-term effects. So, until I see the FDA put a stamp of approval on their coffee, I'll continue to buy my own. Macklin, you're the health nut. How can you drink this? It's free. <laughs> Sorry, but when you've spent your entire life working in public health, free becomes your number one consideration. I take the FDA's paycheck and leave them their coffee. My small way of saving our government a few dollars. Is that your minuscule attempt to stem the tide of money flowing out minute by minute while we wait for you? Look, there was a line. I'm sorry. I'm not talking about your coffee run. We've been reviewing this case for months. We've read hundreds of thousands of pages of data. We've looked at animal tests and human clinical trials and proposed labeling and weighed the benefits and risks. And now it's time for us to make a decision. Should diaproxenine be approved for market? I vote yes. Well, I strongly feel- We all know what you feel. I vote yes, Macklin votes no. The only vote we don't know is sitting right there. I was going to say, I feel we should have a paper vote to protect her privacy. But she pretty much made that a moot point. Well, I don't care. Let's just do it. This one's approve. That's me. Spelled approve wrong. Okay, okay, keep going. This one's a no. And that's you. Way to maintain privacy, Flores. What privacy? The only vote in question is the next one. Read it. It's blank. I know. Lukowski, come on. You gotta break the tie. Make a decision. I can't. Uh, not yet. Nanoscience is very new. Too new for any of us to have a firm understanding of the risks. But nano is already everywhere. My kids have nano silver socks that aren't supposed to stink as much. My sister has some nano anti-wrinkle cream for her face. These things are already on the market. Yes, but there are no reporting regulations for cosmetics, so any claim can be made. Diaproxene is far more complicated. I know. The NIH has indicated that there is massive potential for nanoscience in the treatment of diabetes. Everything from non-invasive glucose monitoring to 
improved insulin delivery and targeted molecular imaging. But this, a nanoparticle medication. But they're just tiny particles of things we know plenty about. Yes, but things behave very differently on the nanoscale. I just don't think we have enough information. Oh, you academic types can never have enough information. What more do you need? Diaproxenine is ready for market. It just needs FDA approval. Now, the human trials went well. The animal tests were incredibly successful. Unless you were one of the animals that didn't like it. Well, they have to test it on something. We're not here to debate the ethics of animal testing. Oh, now we're the ones making this take too long? Flores, come on. Lukowski has a right to... To keep diaproxenine in the FDA purgatory of the new drug application process forever? Let's either approve it and get it to market where it can start doing some good, or refuse approval and send Western Pharmaceuticals back to the drawing board. But let's do something. Flores is right, Lukowski. You heard the director of the FDA, who is, after all, our boss, say that nanoscience could have fantastic benefits, but it's also placing new burdens on an oversight agency that's already stretched extremely thin. It costs an average of $350 million to get a new drug to market. And for every moment we spend here jacks that number up. Now, if the risks associated with diaproxidine are real, which they are, then we have a responsibility to keep the population safe by rejecting this application. But we also have a responsibility to make sure that the $350 million, some of which is public money funding the FDA and trickling down to our little nano salaries, is not being wasted by giving endless consideration to alleged risks that are trivial at most. How can you call a person's life trivial? No one has died. Some people have had nausea, the tremors, blurred vision. Those are pretty modest contraindications, if you ask me, especially compared to kidney disease, strokes, heart attacks, the things that come with unchecked diabetes. You're right. Clinical trials indicate that diproxenine is not acutely toxic. No one is going to take it and suddenly kick the bucket. Hmm. But we don't know about chronic sublethal toxicity. And diabetes is a chronic disease. Patients will be taking diproxenine for years, maybe even decades. Look, I'm the toxicologist here, and I see nothing in the data or the structure of the molecule we're looking at that indicates that 10 or 20 years down the road, diaproxenine patients are going to start dropping dead. You don't know, Flores. You didn't do the studies. No, I didn't. The FDA is dependent on the honesty of Western pharmaceuticals. That's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. But in my professional opinion, I know enough. Well, in my professional opinion, based on known side effects, the unknown consequences of taking a drug long term for a chronic condition, the very real possibility of sensitive subpopulations. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sensitive subpopulations? Yes. Individuals who have more serious reactions than most or respond at a significantly lower level. I know what a sensitive subpopulation is. I just don't understand why you're bringing it up. Are you talking about the fat rats? The term is obese. And yes, the obese rats had trouble metabolizing the diaproxenine. But that's not real life. Those rats were genetically engineered to be fat. Well, we can't go find rats that live off double bacon cheeseburgers and ice cream like we can with people. It doesn't matter why they were obese. The point is that obesity seemed to interfere with the metabolic process. And frankly, most diabetic patients are at least overweight. That's a vast generalization. Macklin, listen, you're right. Flores doesn't know that diaproxenine won't prove lethal down the road, and you don't know that it will. We can never foresee with 100% accuracy every possible outcome. That's not our job. Our job is to rank the risks, which definitely exist, and the benefits, which exist as well. And if the benefits outweigh the risks, we approve diaproxenine for market. Thank you, Professor, for explaining my job to me. I'm not trying. But I know what my job is. I'm a biostatistician. I look at the numbers and I decide what will protect and improve the health of people. I understand looking after the health of people. I'm a doctor. You were. What do you mean by that? When's the last time you dealt with a patient? Really dealt with one? Staunch the flow of their blood, clean the pus from an infection, listen to a hacking cough. You've been in research so long at the university, I don't think you even remember what real patients look like. I certainly remember how patients and doctors deal with medications, instructions, and warnings. 
which is why the FDA saw fit to place me on this advisory committee. That in the years of research you disparaged. And with all due respect, Macklin, you're a biostatistician. So you've never dealt with the patient at all. I've traveled all over the world for the foundation. I've seen things, Lukowski. Like babies who were born with no arms because their pregnant moms were given a medication that the toxicologists all said was safe. Are you really playing the thalidomide card? Come on, Macklin, get with the times. Next you'll be telling us we need to get the cocaine out of Coca-Cola. We know that. The FDA has been doing its job with the help of advisory committees like this one since 1938. I think we've learned a thing or two about risk assessment and basing everything on a one-off like thalidomide. It is not a one-off! What about Fenfen? What about Vioxx and Troven? What about those poor kids who took Paxil for their depression and then ended up committing suicide? There is always a rush to market. It is our duty to protect the public and not just by listing recalls on the FDA website. We need to stop these things from getting to the corner drugstores in the first place. But at least an FDA-approved drug continues to be monitored even after it goes to market. If we don't approve it, who's to say some guy who knows the formula and needs to make a few bucks won't help it end up in some so-called herbal supplement that they get sold to sick and vulnerable people over cable TV, and then the risks skyrocket. So you're admitting there are serious risks? Not in the particular form synthesized by Western Pharmaceuticals, no. But once Earth Mother Hippie Dippy brand herbal tablets mixes it with ginseng and ginkgo and tar and methamphetamines and don't whatever else Don't you think you're being a bit extreme? No, I don't. This is important. And I seem to be the only one who gives a crap about trying to help diabetics. That is completely unfair. New scientific advances are being made every day, but the world will never know their benefit because they get stuck in rooms like this where they wither and die because some bleeding heart that didn't even want to test them on rats can't possibly imagine saving the life of a person because that person might end up with a little blurred vision. And that would make it awfully hard for them to see your halo, wouldn't it? I imagine it's hard for you to see anything from inside the pharmaceutical industry's pocket, Flores. What's that supposed to mean? You've spent what? Two decades working for Big Pharma? Don't you think that gives you just the tiniest little bias? No, I don't. I'm not interested in selling or marketing pharmaceuticals. I'm a toxicologist. And my employment in the industry is a matter of public record. An industry which paid for your house and your car and your kids' college funds. I and did a job and I got paid for it. The same way the foundation paid you and the university paid Lukowski. And right now, the FDA is paying all three of us to be honest and disinterested experts. We're scientists. We look at facts. Sometimes the facts support one side. Sometimes they support the other. We let the numbers do the talking. If this is so cut and dried, why are we still arguing? We've looked at endless results. Clinical trials, cohort studies, case reports. The problem is the studies don't agree with each other. Which is why I'm still sitting on the fence on this. I honestly don't know what the right answer is. Well, we can't sit here forever. You'll eventually have to grow a backbone and choose a side. And in the meantime, people are dying of diabetes. Come on, Flores. We live in modern times. Yes, diabetes needs to be treated, but it's not necessarily a death sentence anymore. Oh, yeah? Tell that to the people who keep dying. I'm sure they'd be very happy to hear it. You're a biostatistician, Macklin. Numbers are your job. You should know that more people die from diabetes every year than from breast cancer and AIDS combined. Then maybe we should be spending all this time and money educating the public on prevention and management of diabetes. Maybe if they learn to eat right and lose weight and take their insulin the way they're supposed to, they wouldn't need some magic bullet medication that they think will make their unhealthy lifestyle sustainable. Oh, I see because diabetics are all a bunch of lard butts who are just too lazy to choose not to have diabetes. That is not what I meant. Because they all live off double bacon cheeseburgers and ice cream, isn't that right? I am only saying that the typical diabetic... The, the typical diabetic? Typical. There are a number of factors common to many diabetics. Is this your typical diabetic? When you 
Think of a diabetic. Is this what you see? Flores. This is my daughter. She has diabetes. And not because we fed her double bacon cheeseburgers or ice cream or genetically engineered her to be obese. She has a disease. It's not her fault. I'm so sorry, Flores. Of course you are. No one wants a little girl to have diabetes. They just want to convince themselves that if she eats right and takes her insulin, she'll be fine. And she might. But she might not. But at the same time, don't you think this is causing you to have a bias? Of course there's a bias, Macklin. Everyone is biased. That's because we're people, not machines. And we can strive to make a cold, empirical decision. But what it comes down to is that we're only human. Surely you don't want your daughter on a risky drug? I want her alive. I want to see her graduate and get married and get old like me. That's what I want. Of course you do. It's easy to forget that the drugs we're approving will be used on real people, on individuals who will assume both the risks and the benefits. But which one is greater? That's the real question we're here to answer, isn't it? That's the decision with which we are charged. Do diproxenine's benefits outweigh the risks? Well, everyone knows how Macklin and I feel. So I guess it's really up to you, Lukowski. It's time to make a decision. 